Welcome to IBD Insider, patient updates from the 2023 Crohn's and Colitis Congress. I'm your moderator, Sophia Vicari, founder of the IBD social media brand, The Princess Promise, which I created to inspire, educate, and humor the IBD community. As an ulcerative colitis patient for the past six years, I understand firsthand the importance of not only advances in IBD research, but also making that information accessible to the IBD community. I am so excited to be here tonight as we learn more about this disease together, because one thing is for certain, as isolating as IBD can feel, we are not alone. Last month, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the American Gastroenterological Association hosted the annual Crohn's and Colitis Congress, the premier meeting for IBD. More than 1,300 IBD health professionals and researchers came together to discuss the latest research about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Tonight, we're taking the information presented at the Congress and bringing it to you during IBD Insider so that you have the most up-to-date understanding of your or your loved one's disease. You'll hear from an IBD patient and clinicians on some key highlights from Congress, including the latest in IBD treatments and the future of IBD care. The information shared is meant to be for educational purposes only and should not replace any advice or guidance from your own healthcare professional. The program will be recorded and posted on the IBD Insider website, crohnscolitisfoundation.org slash IBD Insider. And everyone who registered for the program will receive a link with the recording next week. We want this to be as interactive and engaging for you as possible, so we encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A box, which can be found at the lower part of your screen. Following our expert presentations, I will moderate a Q&A session with all of our panelists and will address as many questions as we can. On behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the American Gastroenterological Association, thank you all for joining. Now, our first presenter, I'm super excited. Our first presenter is someone I've been following on social media for a while. The founder of Own Your Crohn's herself, Tina Aswani Omprakash. Tina is a Crohn's disease patient and a true health advocate for the chronically ill and disabled. She is the co-founder of the South Asian IBD Alliance, the first patient clinician organization in IBD to address global disparities in the South Asian IBD population. She's an active volunteer with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and Gastroenterological Association, as well as a board member for the United Ostomy Associations of America. Tina was the official patient reporter for the Crohn's and Colitis Congress, and we are happy to have her here today to share the key learnings from Congress. Welcome, Tina. Thank you so much, Sophia, for the kind introduction. And I just wanted to say thank you. Um, to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the American Gastro Association for having me report um, on the Congress. It was a true honor to be able to bring this information back to our patient community. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so what I wanted to do today is go over some of the key takeaways, um, you know, from my opinion as, as a patient uh, in this space. I think there's a lot of buzz in the IBD space um, that's been going on a lot lately, and I wanted to bring that all to you. Um, I think that, you know, with all the therapeutics coming out, um, different options for us patients, um, there are also a number of other technologies coming out. And, um, you know, in terms of remote monitoring, in terms of, you know, understanding this disease better, there were some presentations around, you know, artificial intelligence being used, um, wearables, stickers. So what do I mean by wearables? Um, they might be um, things that you would put on your abdomen or on your arm. Um, stickers too. The idea behind these is that they could sense inflammation and pick up on inflammatory markers through your skin um, and through your sweat. Um, with regards to stem cells, um, there was a lot of talk around um, stem cells for perianal fistula, um, so localized sort of a treatment um, of these fistulae but also autologous stem cell transplant um, that is being, uh, you know, in, that is in trials right now as well to reset the immune system. So lots of things going on in the space. There's also um, studies that are focusing on preventing and sort of intercepting that development of 
IBD. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more later, but that was some of the things that I found very exciting about, you know, some of the technologies and remote monitoring that's going on. Um, in terms of new medications, we've seen a bunch come out just in the last year, and there's a bunch more coming out in the next couple of years. Um, and I think we're trying to understand how do we position these different medications so that patients can have sort of the optimal quality of life uh, without having to go through several iterations of medication? So really this um, a development of precision medicine, trying to understand how to position uh, different therapeutics. The whole idea behind this and the whole theme behind the remote monitoring, the technologies, the new medications is how do we improve patient care by halting that progression of disease? Next slide, please. Um, some other key takeaways, um, and this is a photo of uh, myself with a couple of patient advocates. Um, one is a dietitian as well, and one spoke with me on the diversity and IBD panel um, as a Hispanic advocate. Um, so now that I've mentioned um, diversity, I figured I'll just go into that first. Um, I, I think this is was an important takeaway is that, you know, we really have to consider not just race and ethnicity culture, but also sexual orientation, age, gender, religion, and factoring in, um, in a person's care. Um, so we really need to consider these things when making recommendations, yes, but therapeutically, but also in managing mental health and managing diet. And that brings me to the point of multidisciplinary care. This was a key point that I felt was uh, emphasized throughout. It was a thread throughout the entire Congress from the IBD A to Z sessions, the case studies that were going on and being discussed, even the shark tank discussions that some of the physicians were at having um, around whether patients should have surgery or what drug should they go on and why. It was really all about multidisciplinary care. It was all about patient centricity. There were a number of sessions on diet in the pediatric session, but also um, separately for the advanced um, practice providers, meaning some of the nurse practitioners and PAs who were involved. There was a lot of discussion around diet and nutrition, sort of those sociocultural concerns. How do we consider, you know, different kinds of dietary needs and how do we prevent over-restriction and malnutrition? The other piece of this that was very important is making sure that we're focusing on mental health and that trauma-informed care is extremely important. Now, what do I mean by trauma-informed care? What I mean is that we have to consider that patients are facing post-traumatic stress, whether it's from this illness or from some of these medical procedures, and we need to factor that into some of the care that you know um, providers are providing for us patients. So overall, my impression was very positive. It was a very like even though it's a large conference, it was there was that sort of intimate affair in the sense that it was it was fun, it was lighthearted, but it was also serious in the sense that like let's get down to business and let's help patients as much as we can and let's focus on the entire holistic perspective of their life from medications to mental health to diet and to, to everything, even sexuality and intimacy. So I just thought it really ran the gamut and I wanted to make sure I could bring that to you all today. Thank you so much, Tina. I especially liked the multidisciplinary approach to care. I think it's so important that we remember, even though a lot of our symptoms manifest in the gut, mental health is just as important. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. And now I would like to introduce our featured expert presentations from Dr. Neil Hyman and Dr. Sabina Ali, both of whom served on the organizing committee and presented at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress. So the first presentation from Dr. Neil Hyman is about IBD therapeutics in 2023. Dr. Hyman is a professor of surgery and chief of the section of colon and rectal surgery at the University of Chicago Medicine. He is past president of the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons and associate editor of the Annals of Surgery and the Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery. Welcome, Dr. Hyman. Thank you very much, Sophia. And um, I have no uh, disclosures, except I would disclose that, Tina, your summary was spectacular. And I really do think you did a wonderful job of uh, covering the uh, waterfront. So perhaps I'll just delve a little bit deeper. I guess the other disclosure I should have is that I'm a surgeon. No, you're great. 
next slide's great, is that I'm a surgeon who's going to be summarizing a lot of the discussions, you know, regarding medical uh, therapy. So just bear with me a little bit. I think one of the issues is that just as was highlighted, we know that whether it's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, one of the common denominators is inflammation. So the, the benchmark or the hallmark or the strategy for treatment is always how do we reduce, how do we treat and prevent and block inflammation? And so the issue there is the body is incredibly clever. And every time we think that we've blocked a certain pathway, it turns out there's another and another and that they're very redundant. So there are many, 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 many strategies to block the immune system. And um, I think that's where these new classes of medications and development largely relate to is how do we block the development. I don't know if you can hear this, but I live in Chicago, so it's a little ambulance outside. I apologize if that's coming through. Um, so one of the things that was discussed is that, you know, that some of the medications are in development, but some are here already. You know, various medications that either um, improve on uh, existing pathway blockade. So for example, one of the, a lot of the new, for example, some of the newer medications that we used to have a class of medications that block this interleukin 12 and 23. Now it turns out that, you know, a lot of times, a lot of thing in, in medical development is that, well, can we block the one that we want to block that's more important and not cause the side effects from perhaps blocking the other interleukin, if you will. So some of the medications like IL-23 um, blockade was just medication that's more specific. And uh, many of the other medications um, relate to some of the new developments. And as Tina said, many of new medications have come on. And I apologize, Sabina may want to uh, disagree with this or amplify it. But the way I always think about every new, the, all the new biologics for the most part, like what I always tell patients, again, even though I'm a surgeon, is that it's a third, a third, and a third, meaning that all the medications, about a third of the time, they put you in remission, a third of the time, they make you better, but not great, and a third of the time, they don't help you. And, you know, that with the new medications that are out, none of them are home runs, none of them are miracles. But um, they do, um, again, seem to have similar efficacy to the other medications that we uh, already have. But importantly, some work or others have failed, right? So that's helpful that, you know, no, I'm a surgeon, but no one wants to have an operation. And at the end of the day, um, it's nice to have alternative medicines, just as Tina said, where do we position these things that there are? opportunities to try new medications and new classes of medications for those who failed. The other thing that's a real transition, and I'll be speaking about this in just a moment, is that instead of saying, how do you feel? And you say, hey, I feel better. So the medicine must be working. That's not really any longer an acceptable or at least standalone metric for the efficacy of medications. So that I think we're really focusing on mucosal healing and instead of saying just that this medicine makes you feel better, the question is, does it clear up the inflammation? And so the use of endoscopy to monitor response is becoming increasingly important in these clinical trials. So I'll take the next um, slide, please, and thank you. So then the issue is, as I said before, we have all the body has all these different mechanisms to cause inflammation. And so usually we do one medication. But the question came up is, what if you do two? What if you block inflammation one pathway with one medicine, like say the traditional medications like infliximab, you know, you block the so-called TNF alpha, and then you add another one that blocks the IL-12 and 23. So if one medication is good, if you've got bad disease, it's two better. And generally the answer, the consensus was no. And I was participating in that shark tank where we were arguing these issues. But in general, I do think it's fair to say that there was a consensus that a second class of medications or a second biologic specifically really doesn't seem to add a lot as a general rule of thumb. And that obviously, as everybody on this call knows, these medications are biblically expensive. You know, so the idea of adding a second medication that doesn't help you know, is, is obviously not desirable. And perhaps more importantly, 
that there's safety concerns, you know, that if you knock out inflammation in the immune system, if it's not helping, then there's a fair chance that it's going to be hurting because it could be blocking immune response to infections, for example, and the like. And so we're not, there was no clear consensus, you know, that we should be moving to multi-drug, multi-biologic uh, regimens. I'll take the next slide, please. Another thing that was interesting that the person who spoke in the session after me, um, that um, there is this um, um, so-called GLP-2 agonist uh, glucagon-like peptide called a tadeglutide. And at the end of the day, what this does is um, it, it enhances the growth and function of cells in the stomach and intestine. And it's quite expensive, but where it's being used is, for example, in people who have short gut um, and are TPN dependent, that this medication has been able to get people off intravenous uh, nutrition because they absorb so much better. Um, so one of the things, at least for me as a surgeon that interests me as somebody who does a lot of these J pouches, you know, so to speak, the question is, is can this class of medications be used for people who have 10 bowel movements a day to have four bowel movements per day? But in other words, this to me is exciting with respect to function and improving, you know, quality of life related to diminishing stool frequency. So, you know, that's something certainly that I'm keeping my uh, eye on. I'll go to the next one, please, if we can. And thank you. So um, I want to just, uh, you know, as I said, I am an IBD surgeon and I do want to throw a few things out with respect to this. And uh, again, this was another point that Tina highlighted about multidisciplinary input. I'm a surgeon and no, you know, no normal, per no one wants surgery per se. Um, and I think any IBD surgeon understands that. And so, as I like to say, I always love to meet people when they don't need surgery. You know, so my first visit is almost always, let's talk about this. You know, let me tell you what surgery is like, what it would be, what you could expect, what the side effects are. And I always say that I don't want, let's not make any decisions about it. You know, that I think this is informational, just put it in your pocket so that you're fully informed of all of your um, options. And um, uh, I hate to sound like an old codger, but when I was a young doctor, when I was a young surgeon, you know, we really had no medication really for IBD, you know, for uh, at least for small bowel disease, for Crohn's disease, meaning that steroids work, but they made, you know, people would come to come to see me who were 32 going on 80 because they had cataracts, you know, they had all kinds of bone um, awful, you know, complications. So we really didn't have very much in the way of medicines. And so the whole issue with surgery was that, oh my gosh, is that I can resect this disease, but it's the nature of Crohn's, it can recur. So some people would live to be 111 and never have any more trouble, but then there would be people who had the disease recurred in seven years, there are people who recurred in six months. So it was very much like the Forrest Gump box of chocolates after surgery, you never knew what you were gonna get um, in the long term. So we would try very, very hard not to do surgery unless we really have to. So would there be statements like surgeries for complications? But now, paradoxically, think about this. Because we have so many effective medications and so many options, and we know that medications are generally effective at inflammation, not effective once you have complications of disease like perforation or scar tissue with stricturing, that how about this? Why don't we say, hey, you know, most people with Crohn's disease, for example, have had the disease for many years before they get diagnosed because the symptoms initially are pretty nonspecific. So that um, all that you have scar tissue, you might have complications of disease. So in comes you working with the gastroenterologist and, you know, that the Crohn's has been active, for, for example, for many, many years. And there was unopposed inflammation and scar tissue set in. So um, that's not a fair fight. It's like a, coming into a baseball game in the eighth inning, you're down 11, nothing, and you're trying to win the game. So there's this concept of surgery is the reset button. Let's start fresh. That really wasn't fair. Do over that. Let's remove the inflamed, infected, scarred, or fistulized disease 
leave only fresh and healthy bowel. And then instead of hoping that it stays good, you know, we'll start one of these biologic medications. And again, instead of hoping that works, that maybe in six months you'll have colonoscopy to make sure that, every, that there's no ulcerations forming, that you're on the right medicine at the right dose. So paradoxically, um, that I think we're actually, in, at least in Crohn's disease, um, we do the first surgery earlier, you know, so that we can hit the reset button and give people a fresh start and ha let them have access to medications in a setting where it'll likely work. Um, and uh, the, the last um, slide, please. I'll leave my last slide. So, and, and, and this was highlighted, but I can't say it enough times, and this is a delight for me as a surgeon. It used to be that okay, that there would be a debate. The gastroenterologist says, here's the role of medicine. And, you know, then the surgeon would say, no, surgery is better. You know, and there would be that debate and the medical guys all talk to each other and the surgeons all talk to each other. But I think um, at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is we know that IBD management is a team sport. It's a partnership between a patient their family, a gastroenterologist, and a surgeon that requires forthright communication. So, and, and in very importantly, mutual respect. So that, um, you know, we all say what we bring to the table, that um, we talk to each other, and that we try and work individually to craft the very best solution for the patient. So I think that what's exciting to me is over the last number of years, this team approach this emphasis on multidisciplinary collaboration um, to try and achieve the best outcome. So I will uh, stop there and I wanna thank, thank you for the privilege and honor of participating in this session. Thank you, Dr. Hyman. I particularly liked your approach of the body is clever. I know I when my body misbehaves, even that in itself is a negative outlook. I have a lot of negative words for it, but the idea that my body is clever, maybe it's a puzzle that we're all trying to solve together in this team approach. So thank you for that. And now I'm very pleased to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Sabina Ali, who is here today to speak about the future of IBD care. Dr. Ali is professor of pediatrics. She serves as the medical director of the IBD program and the co-director of pediatric gastroenterology at UCSF in Oakland, California. Welcome, Dr. Ali. Thank you, Sophia. Um, thank you to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the AGA for um, the invitation. I'm humbled to be a pediatric gastroenterologist uh, doing this session. Um, next slide. I have no disclosures. So I think we can start with what may an IBD patient journey may look like in 10 years. Um, it, we have seen so many exciting changes in the last 30 years. We remember there was only prednisone 30 years ago, but now we have a fair share of good tools in our box. Um, our current treatments do focus on an immune uh, dysregulation pathway, but we know there is a lot of interest in other areas. Uh, where we think IBD starts, whether it be something going on with our microbiome, some environmental triggers. We also have learned that one size does not fit all. And moving towards personalized care, which both Tina and Dr. Hyman alluded is, we need to start looking also into the right drug, the right dose for this patient, what will work, what is the timing of um, and the route. There is a lot of interest on focus on other therapies, not just medication. We have a lot of new pathways, as Dr. Hyman uh, mentioned. You know, we um, we are looking at uh, not just one pathway, but all these newer pathways we have learned, and there is um, and keep learning. Also, combination trials, whether it be combination of two medications, but also combination of diet and medication to see what may work best, and other therapies like microbiome therapy um, and interest has been so much in the nutritional therapy area. Next slide. So as Tina mentioned, there was a lot of interesting talks on different apps and different module modules, how we can um, monitor. So we are definitely in an area of digital health, you know, just example of just not having a telehealth visit with your doctor, 
but we have all these fancy biomarkers and data learning just as a part of a diagnosis. And even when you are in a treatment, how you may respond to a treatment, um, having telehealth appointments and sending your information, your symptoms, uh, data to your doctor before the visit so they can, so before, um, so you, when you get to the appointment, how can that be used and how do you, and even on a treatment, how is best to monitor um, what will work best for someone? Um, how do you predict which medicine may work best and how do you monitor response to that medicine and long-term looking at prognosis. So definitely there is a lot of work in different apps and different other digital um, areas. Next slide. So Tina had mentioned about stem cell therapy. There was a wonderful uh, discussion and robust discussion on this topic. It is a big unmet need in IBD. We know that. Uh, it is one of the most difficult areas of treatment, both with medication and surgical options being there. Um, mesenchymal stem cells are what um, is being uh, looked at and is part of the research. They are healthy donor cells from a bone marrow. Um, stem cell based therapies is definitely showing promising results in trial and may um, end up to be superior to other treatments without the risk of patients having incontinence. Um, so definitely there is a lot of promising uh, data coming out in this um, area. Next slide. So nutrition, which is always the hot topic, it's a favorite topic for all of us because there is so much to learn. Um, diet does affect, we know our, you know, a lot, but our inflammation, our symptoms, our overall health. Uh, we all know exclusive enteral nutrition has shown to be effective as an induction treatment for Crohn's disease. There is a lot of solid diets um, that, um, being looked at. There is data now uh, for specific carbohydrate diet, Crohn's disease exclusion diet, Mediterranean diet, the Dine CD study. Uh, future, we have to also look into what will work best. I and mean, all diets may not work for one patient, but uh, can we learn uh, from these uh, research studies and use some uh, AI tools for precision nutrition uh, therapies? Um, also look into anti-inflammatory diets, do more randomized controlled trials. Also maybe uh, hopefully in the future have some biomarkers to know who will respond and who will not respond what things trigger and what may put us in relapse, um, and then personalized predicting. Um, but most important, I would say, when you are thinking about using diet, please in, uh, involve a dietitian. Uh, don't do this by yourself uh, because these diets can be complicated and these can be very restricted at times. Um, next slide. So what will it get to a cure or prevent IBD? Um, you know, I always get asked this question, um, is there a cure for IBD? And my answer is not yet, but it doesn't mean it's not coming. There is so much progression in medical therapy. Uh, we do need to break this therapy ceiling, which we call, uh, we need to look into early diagnosis, stratify our patients who are more high risk. Um, as we said, I talked a little bit about improved care delivery, whether it be through monitoring, um, AI tools, shared decision making, um, looking at new therapies, combining therapies, whether it be two medicines, medication and uh, diet or other uh, ways, um, and understanding better pathogenesis. We have to understand where it starts um, and make a diagnosis earlier. Next slide. So when does IBD begin? That's the one question that came up and a very interesting discussion uh, is, does it happen in utero when you are not, uh, when you are developing as a baby after birth, whether it be uh, during the process of birth, C-section, which is vaginal delivery, um, how does microbiome changes, the environmental exposures, depending on where we live in the different areas of the world, um, we can cure, but we need to know the cause. So the, that's the biggest question is how do we intervene before it starts? Um, we need a lot of deep understanding of the biology and epidemiology of IBD to think about all the triggers, how we can stop the trigger before it gets to that target um, and looking at therapies on that target to prevent that disease from happening. Um, so Yes, we need to pursue this far off goals and we need a lot of investigation, which means we also need a lot of participation in research trials and a lot of funding to help move this field forward. Next slide. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Ali. It was very interesting about the therapeutic ceiling. I mean, we hear about the glass ceiling all the time, but never the therapeutic ceiling. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. And now let's bring back all of our presenters and we'll take some questions from our audience. Don't forget, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box down below and we will get to them uh, as many as possible. And remember, this is meant to spark your conversation with your medical care team. So if we don't get to your question, maybe your doctor can. Shameless plug for open communication. So we're gonna kick things off today with Dr. Ali. We had a few questions about complementary therapies, Chinese herbs, low-dose naltrexone, curcumin, and other natural therapies. Was there any discussion or update at Congress on incorporating these therapies along with traditional Western medicine? Not in particular about a specific, I would say, uh, but you know, there's always the interest in, in uh, looking at complementary therapies, uh, but not specifically at one specific one. Thank you. And Dr. Hyman, we have a question here. You mentioned tegeltide. I uh, know I said that wrong. I'm sorry. For patients with J pouches, would it be effective for patients who have total colectomies and will it stimulate growth and function of cells in the small intestines and thereby increase the amount of nutrients a patient with no colon might absorb? It, it will, it does, and it would. The issues are a multi- a multiple. One is that, like many things, you know, is you don't get anything for free. So, for example, in people say who have a colon, there this stimulation of growth has caused polyp growth, you know, in pe in people's colons. So there's, so there's concern that will it cause growth of bad cells and will it cause cancer, you know, in people in some people, you know, in the long term. That I again. Um, Anecdotally, I will to the few patients I've seen are on it and people who treat with this, you know, that there are a substantial number of people have side effects or intolerance, you know, with this medication. Um, and um, it's extremely expensive, you know, and so at the end of the day, I think that there's, there's an area of excitement, but I think, you know, I, I don't mean to be corny, but I, I like to think that we introduce these things in a um, in a responsible way, you know, that you study them carefully, ideally clinical trials, but you give it, you know, you start with people who are in extreme circumstances, like that's a good one. Somebody who has to be fed intravenously and have intravenous nutrition every night at home. You know, there's a lot to be said about getting off that. But I, I you know, in other words, I think we need to know a lot more. So I certainly wouldn't have intended to uh, implicate that this is a treatment that I think people should be on or that we know eno enough about it. Dr. Ali, I hope I didn't put you, don't put you on the spot, but I'm thinking as a pediatric gastroenterologist, you'd likely have some thoughts about that. Yeah, I agree with you. So um, outside of the inflammatory bowel disease patient population in pediatrics, we take care of a lot of patients who have uh, short bowel syndromes for other reasons after birth. Um, and those are the, exactly the concerns is um, everything has its risks and benefit and it has to be looked at and individualized for each patient. Thank you both. And since we have you both willing to collaborate on questions, this question is for both of you. What are your thoughts on pill medications for ulcerative colitis? Zanimod and Rizinkizumab uh, versus biologics. Um, I can start. So, you know, these are the newer uh, medications called small molecules. Um, there is a lot of uh, good uh, data from trials and a lot of promising uh, data that is in the real world. So I think it also depends on each patient, what has been tried before, um, what other um uh, if, depending on what uh, other symptoms you have or other um, things like, you know, if you have hypertension, blood pressure issues, things like that. So you have to look at what is works um, for that patient, not just for their uh, colitis and monitoring uh, side effects. Um, so definitely there is, it's an exciting uh, medication and, and more up for the patients with colitis. Dr. Hyman, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I don't have much to add. You know, I think that all of these things, they just give additional choices. And as I was sort of implying that, 
not only the right drug for the right patient, but the other issue is it's always nice to have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. Because as I said, it's maybe not a lot of patients, but there are some who don't respond to one, but will respond to another. Sophia, if I could just add, like from a patient perspective, I would just say not only is it about like the patient preference for injection infusion um, versus pill, I think that, you know, different mechanisms of action, and I'm sure the physicians could um, talk about this more and we'll hear about this more, I'm sure, in future research. But I, uh, my understanding is that there's different mechanisms of action, like Dr. Uh, Hyman was talking about with IL-12, IL-23. Um, some of the newer therapies might be more targeted. Some of the JAK inhibitors might be more targeted, like we're seeing with Rinvoq. Um, so, and we're also seeing like the new mechanism of action, I think the S1P. So, you know, people respond to different things too. So this gives us like more of an arsenal and honestly, for me, more hope that, you know, I, I was on my last option of drugs and now, you know, there's new options for Crohn's, you know, so it, it is kind of creating that hope for me that, hey, if my medication stops working, maybe something else will work, you know? So I think that's that's really the bottom line around, you know, getting some of these new medications out there. Right, I agree, Tina. And I think this to mention that some of the medications have um, some guidelines of you cannot use them as first line and you have to use certain. So I think it depends and what have you tried before and how it has worked. And you may have had a partial response or no response. So it a um, lot of things to look at when you talk about medicines with your gastroenterologist. I think one of the most uplifting things that I've gotten from this webinar so far is the multitude of options. I know my drug came out, I'm on NTVO, so it came out not too long before I needed it. And I can't imagine how different my life would be if, if it wasn't on the market yet. And so, um, like you said, Dr. Hyman, having plans A, B, C, and D, I mean, anyone with a disease with uh, urgency and frequency knows you, you keep an extra pair of leggings in the car during a flare and you just, you have that plan B, you never know when you might need it. So thank you all for that. And our next question is for Dr. Ali. It's about stem cell therapy. So is it expected that it would be a cure or would repeat treatment and medication still be required? Yeah, that's a great question. And that was the question that was asked uh, because some patients may require a repeat uh, um, stem cell um, or because they may get a partial response um, and but some don't. Um, so I think those are the questions that are being answered uh, during um, with this research um, is if uh, who are the patients who may need repeat therapies who may not. And definitely, you know, it can be, um, you know, Put patient in a remission, I would say. Excellent. Now, okay. I'm sorry, if I just might, you know, add to that, you know, that I think we all sort of understand that, you know, problems with anal fistulas and perianal problems are really difficult, you know, very difficult and really impact and impair quality of life. You know, that um, I agree, we're all sort of a little bit excited about stem cells, but you know, again, it's been another example of something like, for example, there was a large European uh, control trial that what's important to understand in the background is that many people with Crohn's disease, the fistulas heal spontaneously, even with no treatment. There are some that will respond to biologics and that in the clinical trials that in the placebo arm, meaning that got nothing, there was a significant minority that healed. And the stem cells did a little bit better. But, you know, I, I, I think that, it, you know, because it's a very common question that I get. So we're very excited, you know, that you can help anybody. But, you know, it doesn't look like necessarily at this point a magic bullet. But whether that's because we don't have the right kind of stem cells, how much do you give? How many injections? Should you wash it in? Should you inject it? You know, there's a million things that, frankly, we don't know yet. So it's promising. But I, I, I personally, perhaps um, uh, Tina and, and uh, Dr. Lee will disagree, but I, I personally don't uh, see it quite yet as a magic bullet, but, you know, something that's in development. Right. It's one of the unmet needs, right? It's, it's as you said, Dr. Hyman, it is um, something, um, but another tool in our box to um, see for patients that it may work for. Yeah, um, I totally agree. I mean, I've had several um, perianal rectovaginal fistulae over the years. 
And I think between surgery and biologics, that's what was available to me at the time. Uh, obviously, the stem cells, um, these localized stem cells um, make a lot of sense to, to, to give a shot, especially if they are approved. I think they're very limited right now and at a couple of institutions. But, you know, I, I think this is something we can look out for. And there are consortiums happening and things like that happening, trying to come up with best practices for this. Um, so I would keep an eye out. I, I don't know if people are asking also about autologous stem cell transplant. I think Jim Lewis, Dr. Jim Lewis was talking about some of Dr. Lewis Cohen's practices at Mount Sinai. Um, and my understanding is that that is quite an extreme procedure. And, you know, um, I, I have seen patients uh, undergo um, this procedure when they have not responded to any therapeutics. Um, and it's been quite extreme and they do usually uh, relapse within a few months and are, uh, there is a protocol that they have developed that Dr. Lewis was talking about. And usually they do start the patient on interview and perhaps move them to another biologic over time. But the point is it may not cure the disease, but it can help the patient start responding to the existing therapeutics. And I think that's a key point to remember that these aren't necessarily curative, but they can give us better quality of life. Absolutely, thank you. Now, another question that came up is, is there progress in testing or biomarkers that help indicate which type of biologic or pathway will be most effective for patients so that we don't waste time and disease progression going on a biologic pathway that is probably not even going to help? That's, that's a great question. And I think that's the question um, or answer we are all looking for is the term personalized medicine, right? So if um, I know which patient, which route, which drug, um, you know, um, but I think we are we are learning, you know, we are learning with certain disease, physical nature of the disease, what some, you know, patients may respond better and some patients need uh, with certain, um, you know, colitis patients or younger patients, uh, patients uh, with certain lab values, they may need higher dosing. So we are learning some of these things with, as you said, Sophia, with certain biomarkers, uh, we are uh, getting a little uh, more information, not putting everyone on the same dose. Um, so I think it's still early, but I think we, as, as I said, in, um, uh, is, you know, we have learned it one size doesn't fit all. So I think we are one step ahead. <laughs> Early but promising. That's the theme of the evening, it seems. We're early and a lot of really promising things. So stay tuned for more. Uh, our next question is, are there any advancements in AI-aided designer drugs targeting uh, based on individual genetic structure, custom pharmaceuticals, more of the personalized medicine approach? Tina, you attempt to attended most of the sessions, if you had anything um, that you came across? I think um, that, that's a really good point, Dr. Ali. Um, I think with regards to AI, um, like Dr. Ali was just saying, everything is uh, starting to trend towards how can we personalize things. But a lot of sort of um, these remote monitoring techniques have been very interesting. Like I, I would personally be interested in seeing wearable technologies or st stickers. And my understanding behind this, um, just in speaking to some of the physicians working on this at Mount Sinai, is that, you know, this, the sweat that's picked up is um, it can have some inflammatory markers in it. And I know there's questions around inflammatory markers throughout as well, um, but they're able to pick up in real time, you know, instead of you having, you know, blood tests every three months or every six months, or instead of you having a scope every two or you, uh, one or two years, not instead, but, um, you know, really uh, in real time being able to see, okay, this patient may be headed towards a flare and maybe we can intervene before it becomes a full-fledged flare. So um, I thought some of these, uh, like the, some of these um, technologies were very interesting. One of the last presentations was on, you know, a uh, an emerging technology, which is intestinal ultrasound, which I know there's a lot of buzz around, 
But again, that's that's not real time, but it is like in the office, right in the office, um, the provider can uh, do this bowel ultrasound and sort of see thickening um, in the wall and of, of, of the ileum. And also there is a benefit for it in ulcerative colitis too. This is not just for Crohn's disease where they can see if a patient has started to respond to a medicine just in the last six weeks or two months or three months. And I think that's very, very useful rather than waiting a week or two weeks to get, you know, the results of an MR enterography or, you know, um, having to do, having to be exposed to radiation due to a CT scan. So we are like seeing that there are safer measures that are happening in real time and producing results quickly so that our doctors can make decisions quickly so that we can respond better and have better quality of life. Yeah, definitely. Intestinal ultrasound is a great new modality, and I think it's getting really more interest in a lot of centers um, because it's, you know, it's easy, it's in the office, it gives you information that may help change some of the treatment plans really fast rather than waiting a long time. It's necessary to get all these other testing done. So it is certainly has a lot of promise. That's fantastic. Now, until we get to the point where wearables and ultrasounds are, are the go-to, we did have a few questions about colonoscopies. Uh, the main one is, how often should IBD patients be getting a colonoscopy? So that depends on, you know, if you have ulcerative colitis versus you have Crohn's disease or indeterminate colitis, or, um, and also is where you are on your treatment. If you are starting a new medication, um, a lot of times you may need a scope, um, you know, at six months versus 12 months period. Um, if you have been having symptoms versus if you have gone into deep remission, which we uh, say when you are feeling great, your labs look great, your different tests we do like stool test, blood test, um, and um, you and your last scope was great, and you you know there is no changes in your medication and um, the ulcerative colitis patient may not need a scope for another eight years. So I think it's very it dependent it depends on where you are on your treatment plan um, and what changes are happening and how your physician um, needs to um, kind of look at. Thank you, Dr. Hyman, anything to add? Yeah, I would just add, it's just always so important when you talk about ultrasound or colonoscopy or whatever the test is to think about what is the question that you're trying to answer. So for example, um, somebody, it was brought up about that if you start a new treatment and you have thickened bowel on a test, ultrasound's terrific because you can just put the probe on and say, it's working, you know, no need to set up an MR enterography or CT enterography. In our center, a lot of centers have interest in it. But as an example, you know, again, perhaps it's parochial because I'm a surgeon, but you know, that I would like, if, if, if we do a resection, say for Crohn's disease, I'm not contented to know that the bowel's not thickened, you know what I mean, after the surgery, that's too late. You know what I mean? So I really want I really want uh, Dr. Ali to look in there, you know, six months after the surgery. And instead of saying we have this pro preventative or prophylactic strategy, I don't want to find out, you know, once the bowel's swollen, you know, so to speak, or thickened, I really want to make sure that the mucous membrane has no ulcerations in it. So we know we're on the right medicine uh, at the right dose. It's always depends on exactly what the question is that you're trying to answer and how will this test change management? How will it help me make things better for somebody? That's a great outlook. And it brings me to one of our next questions. I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit. We did have a question about calprotectin stool tests and how often they should be taken and how effective are they even, how effective are they even? <laughs> So right. I'll that. take that. Yes. Um, so calprotectin, again, um, is a stool inflammation marker. That is another one some, some of you may have gotten. It's called lactoferrin. So calprotectin is not the only one. Uh, yes, it's the one that's most commonly uh, ordered and used. Um, again, it's another uh, marker that's like, what are we looking for, right? If uh, what is, uh, if 
You can get it as a baseline before starting a treatment, looking for response to a treatment. It's non-invasive. Yes, you have to collect the stool sample, which can be not the some of the some of the hardest thing to do at times. Uh, and um, change of therapy. Um, if you're having symptoms and you are trying to figure out, is it because I'm having a flare versus you know, some patients may have IBS symptoms. Um, so those are kind of different ways. I don't think there is a hard set rule of when and how often. I think it depends on what um, your medical team is um, looking for um, to see a response. Um, and um, you had another question, Sophia, sorry, about calprotectin, that was it. Uh, just how often to take them and how effective. Okay. Dr. Hyman, anything to add? No, I agree. Again, it gets back into what's the question, but it's nice to have a stool test, you know, isn't it? You know, rather than being scoped or whatever. And I think there are a lot of questions like basic questions. Is this medicine working that can be addressed by fecal calprotectin? Um, I would definitely add one more thing um, is calprotectin. Maybe a little less sensitive if your inflammation is more in the small intestine. Your numbers may not look high as someone who has colon inflammation. So you have to be mindful uh, of where your baseline is and what uh, where the, your inflammation is. The other, as Dr. Hyman mentioned about, you know, post-surgery, if you get a surgery, maybe that's one test you can do for just kind of checking if you are starting to get inflama inflammation changes before you need the first scope. So one more check before the scope. Yeah, and mm -hmm. as, a, as a patient, I would just add, like I know, um, and I hear this a lot and I myself have um, felt this way a lot is, hey, can I just have that stool sample done? I have an ostomy, so it's just really easy for me to give a stool sample. Um, but a lot of times I think um, we have to also be cautious and realize that some uh, viruses can also shed in the stool as well, like COVID, for instance, the C. diff. So I've, I've actually had high fecal cal protection um, due to those and not necessarily due to IBD. So I think it's important for us as patients to keep in mind that there could be other um, forms of inflammation or infections that could be um, sort of skewing those numbers too. And Sophia, I would definitely add that is, you know, going to be hopefully calprotectin. You can do it at home and get your own results. That's kind of the future and that will be exciting. So you don't have to go to the lab and wait for the results um, So and get your results right away. So it's like, you know, uh, another uh, quick answer to what may be going on for you. Yes, I remember, I don't know if I had that specific test, but in diagnosis, I had several stool samples that I had to collect. And I looked at my mom and we're like, we're getting it done Thanksgiving weekend. I'm not bringing this to the dorm. <laughs> so it was, it was an adventure for sure. But enough about that. How about remission? Uh, either doctor, both doctors uh, would love to hear your, an explanation of the different types of remission. There's histological, endoscopic. Um, you know, can you just help clarify a little bit, please? Yes, you may hear this term a lot. Uh, now, when you go to your uh, gastroenterologist, is the treat to target approach. You know, we have uh, came along in the way of how we want our patients uh, to uh, feel and respond to all these uh, therapies. It's not just you feel great, so that's your clinical response. That your symptoms, what were happening, your you know not having your abdominal pain, your diarrhea or fatigue, or um, the other is biochemical response. I mean, all these stool testing we talk about, or these blood markers, anemia is getting better, um, and then it's going to be uh, endoscopic remission. So when I get a scope, if anything was seen visibly, it's not seen anymore, it's healed. And the last target is histological response. That is that under the microscope, the mucosa looks beautiful. Dr. Hyman, anything to add from a surgeon's perspective? Yeah, I'll just say the flip side of that is what qualifies as recurrence. You know, in other words, that if you have, hey, hypothetically a colonoscopy, you feel great, the lining looks completely normal. 
but the biopsies show a little bit of microscopic inflammation. Is that something that needs to be treated? Is that recurrence? Or do you have, does Dr. Ali have to see it when she does colonoscopy? Or do we have to see it on an x-ray? Or does somebody need to have symptoms? Or worse, does somebody need to have another operation? So these, you know, it's a very appropriate question. Am I in remission or have I recurred? It's always, you know, the, the definitional aspects really um, are critical here. Thank you. And can I just say, I wish all 500 plus of us beautiful mucosa because that, you know, it's all about the inner beauty, right? Inner beauty. <laughs> and so we're going to wrap up with one last question because it is the year 2023 and we couldn't possibly do anything medical without bringing up COVID. So uh, we did have a few questions about IBD and COVID. Was there any discussion at Congress about how COVID has had an effect on IBD? And this question is for anyone who may have heard something exciting. Mm. I didn't hear anything in particular about COVID um, and IBD. Um, yeah. No, I, I think obviously it was a barrier to people getting tested and people wanting to come to the hospital, but I, I'm personally unaware of any direct impact of the virus, like if you had it or you didn't have it, or if you were vaccinated or you weren't vaccinated, um, that um, you know, it made a, a difference on the natural history of your inflammatory bowel disease, but I would urge everybody who's listening you know, to make sure you stay up to speed you know, with respect to the vaccinations, because, you know, many people are on immunomodulatory medicines that impact your immune system. So, you know, this is, you, you know, everyone, I think everyone with IBD should really make sure that they stay up to speed and date on their vaccines. Yeah. I mean, COVID is another virus. We know viruses or infections of some sort can tip our immune system. So, you know, it may have happened to people that they were diagnosed after a COVID infection, um, you know, something that just tipped your immune system like any other virus can do that. Well, thank you all. I mean, sounds like you can still be immune suppressed and hashtag blessed. So that's good to hear. We are so grateful for all of you. And as we close our program, remember, this is meant to spark a conversation with your medical care team, not replace it. Open communication is key to an empowering IBD journey for you, for your uh, loved ones who are taking care of you, and for your medical care team who need to learn more about how IBD is, is working in the world today. So on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the AGA, we encourage you to keep learning about IBD and to visit some of our helpful educational resources. I want to remind everyone to please fill out the evaluation survey that will be sent to you after tonight's program. We really appreciate the feedback and it will help us plan future programming. So thank you all for joining the IBD Patient Education Program and have a fantastic rest of your evening. <laughs>